and welcome to part 27 of our journey through Mark's Gospel. The first written accounts of the stories of Jesus on the road. I'm Sean, God Squad Christian Motorcycle Club's International President, and this week we're looking at Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 56, where Jesus walks on the water. So, Jesus, the unlikely voice of God, and his band of misfits were unlikely disciples. His message and behaviour was attracting social outcasts and getting up the noses of the governing and religious authorities. And Mark paints these pictures in words to remind some early followers of Jesus who were living under persecution in Rome who Jesus is to them and also to us now. And last week Dave took us through a passage where Jesus had been surrounded by a huge crowd and he took pity on their hunger and he seems to have miraculously fed them. And this was a stark contrast to the previous week where Buckshot covered the selfish indulgence of Herod's feasting and the depravity that followed and the execution of John the Baptist. So Jesus, the miracle worker, and Jesus, the practical, compassionate problem solver, was leading by example. The life can be radically different. And this week sees what looks like a strategic exit from that miraculous meal for thousands. And maybe before the crowd got too wise as to what had been happening in their midst, an unhelpful hysteria might have grown. Jesus sent his disciples off into a boat to cross Lake Galilee, whilst he retreated up a mountain for some solitude and prayer. Now, as always, there's lots and lots of layers to it. Not least of all, the imagery of the challenges of the struggles to bridge the deeply alienated worlds of the time of Jew and Gentile, which the previous stormy sea crossing story, which is back at the end of chapter 4, uh, part 20, illustrated. And, uh, and here, if you remember, Jesus visited that crazy Roman military veteran in the graveyard next to the pig farm. But let's pick up on this week's story from chapter 6, verses 45 to 52, initially remembering that Jesus had just fed the 5,000. And it's subtitled, Jesus Walks on the Water. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. Now, Bethsaida, it was a Gentile fishing port on the northeast shore of Galilee. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. And later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. And he was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down, and they were completely amazed, for they hadn't understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. Now this passage, it kind of has a real sense of excitement, of, a, of an eyewitness as to what actually happened that night, and that would have been Simon Peter, who narrated much of this gospel to Mark prior to Peter's execution. Now this story gives us a bit of a problem. Ordinarily, people don't walk on water. Now some have suggested Jesus was walking in the shallows, but Mark details Jesus was in the middle of the lake. And throughout Mark's gospel, the writer wants to show who Jesus is, that he was no ordinary man, neither was he just another ordinary prophet as we shall see today so jesus perhaps perhaps he sees their struggle to row against the wind from his high vantage point and the wind was proving to be hard work but it wasn't the weather that freaked them out it was the sight of jesus walking across the water near them now in fairness i think i'd be pretty freaked out too if i'd seen this in their world and their culture, ghosts or phantoms lived in the unruly and wild sea. That's where they belonged. Their influence was believed to be destroyed or stopped by bodies of water. 
And remember how the herd of pigs that, that had the demons placed in them, how they launched themselves into the sea a few weeks back. Now that will have really connected in that culture. It would have made sense. But what kind of ghost was this that should rise up out of the sea undefeated and walk near them on the surface of the water? Their cultural conditioning would have told them surely this isn't possible, just as it isn't possible for a mere man to be walking on the water. Now, Mark tells us he was about to pass them by, but Jesus had no intention of actually hiding from them, because this, essentially, it was no rescue mission. This was all about it becoming something of an epiphany, a revelation, an opportunity for Jesus to teach them something they weren't understanding about him. Like the crowds, these disciples were intrigued by Jesus' miracles, fascinated by being in his company. They perhaps quite liked the idea of getting up the noses of the authorities, but they just weren't grasping why Jesus was like he was. Their faith was lacking in many ways, and their hearts were, well, they were still hard. They needed to learn not just to rely on him when he was among them, but also on his divine power when he wasn't among them. They were at risk of becoming like the Pharisees and other religious leaders, and sometimes the crowd at the time. They had a stubborn resistance to be open to seeing clearly who Jesus was. The same power that had healed people, that had cast out demons, fed the crowds, was also the same power that was being exhibited over the natural elements. Now there's lots of Old Testament imagery going on in here too. The power of the Lord over the seas, the rivers, the storms and wind is everywhere in Old Testament scripture. Job chapter 9 talks about only God being able to control the sea and walk on the waves. The story of the Exodus saw God make a path through the sea and of course there was that miraculous provision of food afterwards, that manna from heaven each day. And that's reflected in Jesus feeding the 5,000 perhaps. And of course, God identifies as I am to Moses. And the prophet Isaiah's writings, especially in chapters 43, 48 and 51, is full of the Lord being described as I am he. So as Jesus says to his mates in the boat, Back in verse 50, take courage, don't be afraid, fear not, it is I. Jesus is using language that declares exactly who he is. He's joining the dots and with their own history and language as Jews. And it's exactly that kind of talk that will lead to accusations of blasphemy and ultimately the execution of Jesus. Abraham, Moses, Elijah, King David could do a lot. But they couldn't do what Jesus was doing. And chapter 6 concludes with a brief summary of all that's been going on recently. It would also seem that the headwind meant they landed in Jewish Gennesaret and not Gentile Bethsaida. Or maybe Mark is fusing a few stories together as he sometimes did. Verses 53 to 56 continue like this. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. And as soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Now this was very different from Jesus' rejection at his home in Nazareth earlier on in this chapter. And here in the, in the Gennesaret region, Jesus is being hounded by people for healing. And he'd been among Jews, Gentiles, the rich, the poor, the insiders and the outsiders in towns and villages and rural areas. Everywhere people were grabbing at his clothing, possibly at one of the four tassels worn by Jews, which served as a reminder to them to obey God's commands. And perhaps it looked more like they were reaching out in superstitious hope rather than perhaps faith. But Jesus honoured these small steps towards him, even though they and the disciples still hadn't fully grasped who he really was.
So what was all this saying to Mark's first readers at the time? And many early Christian writers understood the imagery of the church as a boat being tossed around on the sea. The first readers of this letter of Mark were certainly encountering their own waves and storms of persecution. To be reminded of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, their sustainer in their midst was important as their faith was shaken. It was, in fact, this good news. And what can it say to us today? Are we constantly just looking to be rescued from hardship or are we really wanting to truly see who Jesus really is and where he is in our midst and in our world around us? And there's some constant themes in Mark, the smallness of faith and the hardness of heart serve as a challenge. So don't be closed to the idea that Jesus was and is this mysterious God-man, if we have any doubt about that. And don't be closed to the idea that if we do claim to be followers of Jesus, that we've learned all there is to know. Don't forget where Christ has worked in your life before, but don't stop learning. The way of ongoing discipleship in Christ demands an ongoing softness of our heart and an openness to ongoing change and challenge and a preparedness to see new things about Christ, even during times of hardship. And therefore, as we allow to do that, it'll change how we live, how we serve and how we love. Now, of course, we can't do this on our own very easily. We need each other. We're literally all in the same boat, whether it be, as Smithy used to say, with the organised church or the disorganised church. I'm going to close with this quote from theologian Mary Ann Beavis. And it says this, from a Christian perspective, God is ever present, yet it is within the context of community, the ancient ship of the church, that faith is fostered and supported. So cheers and God bless you as we continue this journey together on the road through Mark's Gospel. We'll see you next time.